Welcome to another deep dive. And this time, we're traveling all the way to Southeast Asia. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we're heading to Cambodia, specifically the Koanik district in the Mandalkiri province. Hmm. I've heard of Mandalkiri. It's known for its beautiful landscapes, right? Rolling hills, dense forests. Exactly. Imagine a place with lush forests teeming with life. It's a biodiversity hotspot, actually. Wow. Sounds amazing. It is. But that's also why we're here. We're going to uncover how land use in this unique region has transformed over time. And um, to do that, we've got a fascinating 2023 research article from Remote Sensing Applications, Society and Environment, which is packed with satellite data. Satellite data? That's pretty high tech. It is. But to add a human touch, we'll also be drawing on insights from interviews with the farmers who actually call Koa Nice home. That's great. It's always important to hear those firsthand perspectives. Absolutely. So what's fascinating about Koa Nice is that it's kind of a microcosm of the challenges many regions are facing. Like well, it's rich in natural resources, but also experiencing um, rapid deforestation as its landscape changes. So we'll be exploring what's driving these changes and what the future might hold for this special place. I'm intrigued already. So where do we start? Let's zoom in and paint a picture of Koa Nek first. It's a district in Mandalkiri, a province in eastern Cambodia. Right. I remember reading about Mandalkiri, known for its forests, right? Yes. Dense forests and rolling hills. The people there rely heavily on agriculture and natural resources. But as we mentioned, there's a shadow lurking deforestation. Deforestation? It's such a pressing issue globally. It really is. And it's a big concern in Koa Nek. Even the Cambodian government is trying to address it. Oh, how so? They had this initiative called the Rectangle 4 Strategy. Rectangle 4? I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's all about promoting sustainable and inclusive development in Cambodia. It focuses on four key areas, economic yeah. development, social development, environmental protection, and good governance. So understanding how land use is changing is absolutely critical to making this strategy a success, especially in a place like Koh Anaik, which is experiencing such rapid transformation. Makes sense. So we're talking about balancing economic growth with environmental protection and ensuring that development benefits everyone in the community. Exactly. It's a complex issue with high stakes. Definitely. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's go back in time a bit and see how land use in Koanike has actually changed. The research article used satellite imagery to track land cover changes from 2000 to 2020. Wow, that's a significant period. It is. And what they found was pretty alarming. Okay, I'm all ears. What did they find? Over those two decades, Koenig lost a staggering 37% of its forest cover. 37%? That's, that's huge. It is. It's a stark reminder of the speed at which our planet is changing. Now, it's important to note that not all of the land was simply left barren. While forests were shrinking, areas covered by shrubs, grasslands, and importantly, orchard plantations were expanding and the researchers were able to track all of this with remarkable accuracy using something called random forest. Hold on, random forest? That sounds like something out of a fairy tale. It does sound a bit magical, doesn't it? Yeah, is it like some kind of enchanted woodland where the trees um, make decisions? Huh, I wish. In reality, random forest is actually a sophisticated machine learning algorithm. Ah, I see. It's incredibly powerful for analyzing complex data, like, you know, satellite imagery. Think of it this way. The algorithm helps researchers sift through tons of data to accurately classify and track changes in land cover over time. So it's like a high-tech detective piecing together the clues from those satellite images to tell us what's happening on the ground. Precisely. Hmm. But what does this all actually mean for someone, let's say, standing go and ag? What does a 37% loss in forest cover really look like? Well, imagine dense, old-growth forests giving way to sparsely treed landscapes or, um, or vast stretches of rubber, cassava, or cashew plantations. It's a dramatic shift that has, while profound implications for the region's environment and the people who depend on it. It paints a pretty stark picture, doesn't it? It does. But we're not just here to observe, right? We're here to understand why these changes are happening. So let's get to the bottom of this deforestation puzzle. The research points to a few key culprits. They call them driver variables. Driver variables. So these are the forces shaping the land use changes. Exactly. And in Koa Nike, one of the most significant drivers is something called economic land concessions, or ELCs. ELCs. Yes. Yeah. Imagine large-scale plantations carving their way into once pristine forests. Okay, so that's where the ELCs come in. But how do they actually work? Essentially, ELCs are government-granted land leases for large-scale agriculture and industry. Oh, I see. 
They can bring economic benefits to a region, of course. Right, that makes sense. But they've also been a major force behind deforestation, particularly the conversion of forests to, well, rubber, cassava, and cashew plantations. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword then. Economic growth on one hand, but potential environmental consequences on the other. Exactly. And I'm guessing ELCs aren't the only culprit here. You're right. The research also points to the role of illegal logging. Oh, of course. Think of it like a, a silent thief, you know, stealing away precious resources and disrupting the balance of the forest ecosystem. Mm -hmm. This illicit trade has had a devastating impact, you know, accelerating deforestation and degrading the remaining forests even further. It's like a one-two punch. ELCs clearing land for plantations and then illegal logging chipping away at what's left. It's a very apt analogy. But of course, we can't forget about the people. Remember, the research also looked at population dynamics and migration. Right. Those are crucial factors, too. So how do those factors fit into the picture? Well, Cohen Nike has actually seen a significant influx of people from other provinces drawn by the promise of opportunities. Even amidst these land use changes. Yes, even amidst the changes. This migration puts added pressure on the land as more people need space to live and, of course, to farm. It's like a ripple effect. One change triggers another and another. Yeah, precisely. Everything's interconnected. But wait a minute. I remember reading about something called shifting cultivation in the research. Shifting cultivation? Oh, yes. The article mentioned it as a driver of land use change, but I'm not entirely sure what that means. Can you explain? Sure. Shifting cultivation is a traditional farming method where small patches of forest are cleared and cultivated for a few years, and then they're left to regrow while the farmers move on to a new patch. It's often blamed for contributing to deforestation, although, well, it's a complex issue. You see, it has a long history in the region. The impact of shifting cultivation really depends on things like population density and how long the land is left fallow to regenerate. So it's not as simple as pointing fingers and saying, this one practice is the problem. It's about understanding the nuances of how land is used and managed. Exactly, it's about looking at the bigger picture. Okay, so we've got a pretty good grasp of what's driving these changes in Konaik. But what about the future? What does the research say about what we can expect to see in the years to come? Well, the researchers didn't just stop at analyzing the past. They actually used a model called Markov CA to project land cover changes all the way to 2030. So they're looking ahead, trying to predict what might happen. Exactly. And unfortunately, the outlook isn't very rosy for Koenex forests. Oh, no. So we're on a trajectory that could lead to even more deforestation. I'm afraid so. What does that mean for the region's biodiversity then? We were talking earlier about Koenike being a biodiversity hotspot. Right. But if those forests continue to shrink, won't we see some of that incredible life just disappear? It's a very real concern. Remember, forests aren't just trees. They're complex ecosystems. They support a vast array of plant and animal life. Of course, yeah. Think about the endangered yellow-cheeked crested gibbon, for example. I've, I've never heard of that. It's a primate found only in the forests of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And um, loss of habitat due to deforestation is a major threat to their survival. Wow, that's, that's sad to think about. It is. And it's not just about losing these iconic animals, is it? There are also consequences for the people who depend on those forests. Absolutely. Forests provide a whole range of benefits to humans, often called ecosystem services. Ecosystem services. Yeah, like clean water filtering through the forest floor or the pollination of crops by insects that, that rely on forest habitats. Right, right. Those are essential. They are. They're essential for human well-being. And when we lose forests, well, we lose those benefits too. It's like cutting off the branch we're sitting on. The consequences of deforestation ripple out, impacting the environment and the people who live there. Exactly. That's why this deep dive is so important, I think. It's about understanding how everything is interconnected and how decisions about land use have far-reaching implications. Yeah, it's a much bigger picture than just, you know, looking at some trees. Yeah. So, okay, I'm convinced. Deforestation is a serious problem, and we need to find solutions. The research article mentions some possibilities, right? <laughs> Things like promoting sustainable agriculture and strengthening law enforcement to combat illegal logging. But I'm also curious about the human side of all this. Earlier, you mentioned uh, the researchers interviewed local farmers, right? Yes, they did. What did those interviews reveal? Well, those interviews, I think, offer a really valuable window into the lives of the people most directly impacted by these land use changes. 
They spoke with 135 farmers, both indigenous and Khmer communities, who shared their experiences and perspectives. Wow, so they really got a range of voices. They did. That's great. I imagine these farmers are on the front lines of this transformation. What were some of the key things that they shared? One thing that really stood out was the, the diversity of livelihoods in Koh Anaik. You see, while some farmers focus on subsistence farming, growing food primarily for their own families, others have shifted to cash crops or even work as laborers on plantations. So they're adapting to the changing landscape in different ways. They are. It's fascinating to see how people are responding to these challenges. Were there any um, specific stories or anecdotes from these interviews that really stuck with you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There was one farmer I remember who spoke about how the expansion of rubber plantations had made it harder for him to find land to graze his cattle. Oh. Yeah. He had to walk his herd much farther to find suitable pasture, which of course took more time and energy. Makes sense. It was a tangible example of how land use changes can impact even those who aren't directly involved in plantation agriculture. It's a good reminder that these changes don't happen in isolation. They have real world consequences for people's lives, for their livelihood. You're absolutely right. And um, remember earlier we talked about that influx of migrants to Koa and Ike? Yes. Did the researchers learn anything about why these people were moving to a region that's, you know, facing so much pressure on its land. Well, according to the interviews, many of these migrants were actually drawn by the promise of better economic opportunities. So they're looking for a better life, essentially. Exactly. Some came seeking work on the plantations, while others hoped to find land to cultivate, even though it's becoming increasingly scarce. So it's a mix of hope and necessity. Yeah. It makes you realize that this is more than just an environmental issue, isn't it? It's about people trying to build a better future. Absolutely. And it highlights the need for solutions that not only protect the environment, but also address the social and economic factors that are driving these land use changes. Speaking of solutions, I'm curious about the role of that um, rectangle four strategy that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. How does that initiative aim to address these complex challenges? Well, the rectangle four strategy recognizes that sustainable development requires a multifaceted approach. It emphasizes the need for good governance, environmental protection, and equitable economic growth. So it's about trying to find that balance. Exactly. In the context of Cohen Neek, this means finding ways to balance the benefits of economic development with the need to conserve forests. And of course, to ensure that all members of the community share in that prosperity. It sounds like a tall order, but also a necessary one. I'm sensing a theme emerging here, the need for balance balance between economic growth and environmental protection, between the needs of different communities, and between short-term gains and long-term sustainability. You've hit the nail on the head. It's about finding ways to manage land in a way that benefits both people and the planet. Okay, so we've talked about deforestation, the forces driving it, and the impacts on biodiversity, and of course, on people's livelihoods. But let's dig a little deeper into the human side of this story. I remember reading about a fascinating finding related to land inheritance and family size. Can you tell me more about that? Of course. One of the key insights from those farmer interviews was the strong correlation between household size and the amount of land families wanted to acquire. Interesting. The researchers found that larger families often expressed a desire to, well, to secure more land, both to support their current needs and to pass on to their children. This is where those social and environmental dimensions of land use really intersect. It makes sense on a personal level, right? If you have more children to feed and provide for, you would naturally want to secure more land, mm -hmm. especially in a place where agriculture is so central to life. Precisely. And in many cultures, land is seen as much more than just a resource, you know? It's a source of identity, of security, and even social standing. Passing on land to future generations is a way of ensuring their well-being and preserving family heritage. But in a region facing rapid deforestation and land scarcity, this desire for larger land holdings can actually exacerbate the pressure on those remaining forests. It's a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? People want to provide for their families, but in doing so, they might be contributing to the very problems that threaten their long-term well-being. It really highlights the complexity of these issues and the need for solutions that address both the social and environmental dimensions of land use change. Okay, so we've explored the drivers of deforestation, the impacts on biodiversity in people's lives, and even those cultural factors that are influencing land use decisions. But before we wrap up this deep dive, I want to circle back to the issue of solutions. What are some of the strategies that could help chart a more sustainable and equitable path forward for Koenike? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is. 
But the good news is that there are a number of promising approaches out there. One of the key areas highlighted by the research is the promotion of sustainable agricultural practices. So instead of just clearing forests to make way for plantations, there are alternative ways to farm that can benefit both people and the environment. Exactly. One example is agroforestry, which we touched on briefly earlier. Yeah, yeah. It's a technique that integrates trees into agricultural landscapes. So imagine a system where farmers grow crops or raise livestock alongside trees, creating a more diverse and resilient ecosystem. That sounds pretty cool. It is. It sounds like a win-win situation. Yeah. Farmers get to produce food, but they're also contributing to forest conservation. Exactly. What other sustainable agriculture practices are being explored in Koenig? Another important area is the adoption of Climate Smart Agriculture, or CSA. CSA. This approach focuses on helping farmers adapt to the impacts of climate change while also mitigating their own greenhouse gas emissions. So it's about making agriculture more resilient and, um, and less environmentally harmful. I imagine this is especially important in a region like Southeast Asia, which is you know, particularly vulnerable to climate change. You're absolutely right. Climate change is already having a significant impact on agricultural productivity, and it's essential that farmers have the tools and knowledge to adapt. For sure. But it's not just about promoting sustainable agriculture, is it? Earlier, we talked about those devastating impacts of illegal logging. What can be done to, you know, address that problem? Well, strengthening law enforcement is absolutely crucial. Cracking down on illegal logging operations and enforcing regulations are essential steps to protect those remaining forests. It's like putting a stop to a robbery in progress, isn't it? You need someone to protect these valuable resources. Exactly. And it's not just about punishment. You know, it's about creating a system where sustainable forest management is both valued and rewarded. So it's a combination of carrots and sticks, basically. Mm -hmm. Promoting those sustainable practices while also enforcing regulations. But what about the people on the ground? What role can local communities play? in finding solutions. No, empowering local communities is absolutely essential. They are the ones who live in these forests, who depend on them for their livelihoods and have a deep understanding of the local ecosystem. So it's about recognizing their knowledge and giving them a voice in the decision-making process. Precisely. Supporting community-based forest management initiatives can be incredibly effective. This is where local people actually have the rights and responsibilities to manage their own forests. It's about shifting from a top-down approach to one that recognizes the wisdom of those who are, you know, really connected to the land. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I'm starting to see the outlines of a more sustainable future for Co and Ike. But let's be realistic. These solutions require collaboration, resources, and political will. How do we make sure that these good intentions translate into real change on the ground? You're absolutely right. It's not enough to simply talk about solutions. We need to create the conditions that allow those solutions to actually, you know, take root and flourish. And that's where comprehensive land use planning comes in. Comprehensive land use planning. Okay, you've, you've piqued my interest. That sounds like a, um, a pretty big picture concept. It is. Think of it as a roadmap for the future of a region. It's about bringing together everyone who has a stake in the land. So like, woo. Oh, oh you know, government agencies, local communities, businesses, researchers, everyone to develop a shared vision for how land should be used and managed. So instead of everyone working in silos, it's about getting everyone on the same page, creating a plan that considers all the different perspectives and, and needs. Exactly. Comprehensive land use planning, or CLUP, is about taking a holistic, integrated approach. It's about recognizing that decisions about land use have ripple effects across that entire ecosystem, you know, both environmentally and socially. Right. It's all connected. A good CLUP will consider everything protecting biodiversity, ensuring sustainable agriculture, providing housing and infrastructure for a growing population. It's a lot to juggle. It sounds like a pretty complex undertaking but also a, a really valuable one, especially in a place like Koh Ike, where there's so many competing demands for land. I'm starting to see how all these pieces fit together. Sustainable agriculture, community forestry, law enforcement, and then this big picture planning. But how do we make sure these plans actually translate into real change on the ground? What's to prevent them from just gathering dust on a shelf? Ah, that's the critical question. And the answer lies in a combination of strong leadership, clear regulations, community engagement, and uh, ongoing monitoring. You need leaders who are committed to sustainable development, regulations that incentivize responsible land use, and a community that's actively involved in the process. And just as importantly, you need a system for tracking progress and making adjustments along the way.
It's, yeah. it's like a garden, right? You can plant the seeds, but you also need to tend to the soil, water the plants, and make sure they're getting enough sunlight. It's an ongoing process. Speaking of care and attention, I want to go back to something we touched on earlier. The human cost of all of this. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the environmental impacts, but what about the people whose lives are are directly affected by these changes? What can we learn from their experiences? The farmer interviews in this research offer a really powerful reminder that land use change isn't just an abstract concept. It's about real people facing real challenges. One of the things that really struck me was the resilience of these farmers. You know, they're adapting to a changing landscape, finding new ways to make a living, working to provide for their families in the face of uncertainty. It's easy to get caught up in you know, the data and the big picture trends, but ultimately this is about people's lives. It is. Their stories really help us understand the, the human dimensions of these issues. And speaking of stories, I remember one particular anecdote that resonated with me. It was about a farmer who um, had to walk his cattle much farther to find pasture because of the expansion of rubber plantations. It was such a tangible example of how land use changes can have those ripple effects. Mm -hmm. Effects that go beyond just those who are directly involved. Absolutely. It highlights the interconnectedness of everything and the importance of finding solutions that benefit everyone, not just a select few. And I think that's that's a key takeaway from this deep dive. Understanding land use change isn't just about studying maps and satellite images. It's about listening to the voices of the people who live on the land, understanding their needs and working together to create a more sustainable and equitable future. It's about recognizing that we're all part of this ecosystem mm. and that our choices have consequences, not just for ourselves, but for, for generations to come. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the one thing you hope our listeners will take away from this exploration of Koa Nike? I hope they'll ponder this. Even in the face of complex challenges, you know, like deforestation, there's always hope. By understanding the drivers of land use change, by learning from the experiences of local communities, and by embracing those innovative solutions, we can create a future where both people and nature can thrive. 